Good afternoon, and welcome to the Cape Town Press Club at Home, brought to you with the support of the Conrad Adenauer Foundation, and with thanks to our technical producer, Mechrit Grunewald. Next week this time, we will continue with the Cape Town Press Club hustings for the upcoming local government election. It will be the turn of the ANC. Cameron Dugmore, leader of the opposition in the Western Cape Provincial Parliament, will outline the ANC's vision and electoral promises for the Western Cape. But today, we celebrate press freedom and we commemorate Black Wednesday, when on this day, 19th of October, 1977, several newspapers and numerous organizations that were sympathetic to black consciousness were banned by the apartheid regime. Scores of journalists and activists were arrested and detained in a countrywide swoop that had a chilling effect on the media. Our guest today, speaking about the lessons to be drawn from that time, is Jerome Claster, son of the legendary editor of the Sowetan newspaper, Agri Claster, who was among those arrested in 1977. Jerome is the founder and driving force behind the Agri Claster Trust, which champions a philosophy of nation building. And so I hand over now to our guest, Jerome Claster. Welcome, Jerome. Thank you very much for this wonderful opportunity. I'm deeply humbled and overjoyed to speak to you today about the lessons we've learned from the watershed moments that took place on October the 19th, 1977, a day infamously known as Black Wednesday and celebrated today as Media Freedom Day. Last year, the Agriculture Trust commemorated Black Wednesday with a special virtual colloquium in partnership with Sowetan, Wits University, the South African National Editors Forum, SANEF, and DM5 Incorporated under the theme Surviving 2020 and Media Credibility Going Forward. In addition to celebrating the courageous spirit of all those journalists, editors, and activists who stood against apartheid and nurtured a people's desire for freedom, the aim of the colloquium was to address pressing issues currently facing the media and our country at large. We were extremely fortunate to gather an amazing panel of renowned speakers to reflect on that dark day in our history. Our speakers included our chairman of the board of trustees on the agri Cluster Trust, veteran journalist and pro-liberation activist, Dr. Joe Torre, the head of this journalism, Professor Franz Kruger, former journalist, National Development Plan Commissioner and the agri Cluster Trust trustee, Dr. Tami Mazwai, the trailblazing Sowetan editor, Menwabisa Makunga, the forward-thinking Daily Maverick CEO and publisher, Data Style Karen Balas, and the impressive SANIF chairman and Newsroom Africa political editor, Data Bungalwa. The colloquium was facilitated by the remarkable eyewitness news editor, Me Mahlaze Mahlaze, and it was broadcast live on SABC SA Today news channel. The event was a great success. However, our chairman in Dr. Tlole observed something very important about the previous Black Wednesday celebrations. He notes that usually around this time of the year, there were many organizations celebrating Black Wednesday with small events that competed for the same audience and ended up drowning each other in the process. He proposed that we gather all these organizations to collaborate on a single commemorative event to observe this special day to have a greater impact. This was a daunting task. It took some time to put together, but I am very grateful that Dr. Breit Meersman and his team at the Cape Town Press Club put up their hands to help us make Dr. Joel Clawley's vision come true. With their help, we were able to gather over 14 organizations in the media and black, communi black, conscious communi black consciousness community to collaborate on a series of Black Wednesday commemorative events under our single umbrella theme called Nation Building Conversations with Each Other. The first event of the Nation Building Conversations with Each Other calendar was the relaunch of Agri Cluster's Nation Building Philosophy earlier this month on the 9th of October, 2021. It was hosted by the Agri Cluster Trust in partnership with Viz University and The Forge in Bramfontein, Johannesburg. The second event of the nation building conversations with each other was the SANIF gala dinner event in commemoration of Black Wednesday. This event also marked 25 years of SANIF defending media freedom. The next event in our calendar was the riveting public dialogue by the Steve Biko Foundation reflecting on the impact of Black Wednesday on the Black consciousness message. This event took place yesterday 
at the striking Steve Biko Center in, Ginber in Ginsburg, King Williamstown in the Eastern Cape. Today's discussion on the lessons from Black Wednesday is one of five events happening today under our single umbrella theme of nation building conversations with each other. The other events taking place today are the annual Percy Koboza Lecture hosted by the National Press Club, UNISA and the Koboza Foundation, the Freedom Park Social Memory Book Launch hosted by the National Press Club, UNISA and with Professor Mushan Kondo and Mrs. Jade Mufamadi. Also today, we've got the annual Agri Cluster Colloquium hosted by the Agri Cluster Trust, Sowetan, Sanef, DM5 Incorporated and WITS. There's also a soft launch of this year's local government elections media coverage report by the Media Monitoring Africa. Thank you very much to Ndata Brent Miersman and his team at the Cape Town Press Club for your unwavering support in putting together the nation building conversations with each other. Thank you again for inviting me to contribute to this very important dialogue today. It is inspiring to see how all these organizations in the media and black consciousness community have come together in the spirit of Agri Cluster's moral vision of nation building to celebrate this day by reflecting on the events that took place 44 years ago on October the 19th, 1977. The chilly Wednesday morning of October the 19th, 1977 would remain forever seared into my father Agri Cluster's memory. At 7 a.m. that fateful morning, the infamous security police of the apartheid government descended like a ton of bricks on the small cluster home in Midlands, Soweto, south of Johannesburg, violently rattling doors and windows. Agri Cluster was alone with his mother, Regina Manto Atlaster, inside the house, terrified. His mother's pleas for her son's face safety fell on deaf ears as the police swiftly bundled Agri into the back seat of the police car, squeezing his petite frame between two unfriendly giants. On that historic day, 44 years ago, the apartheid government clamped down on a number of organizations and newspapers sympathetic to the black consciousness philosophy. More than 19 organizations and three newspapers, The World, Weekend World and Pro Veritate were banned. The clampdown was aimed at stifling media freedom and silencing those who spoke out against apartheid. The slight figure of the 37-year-old Agri Cluster, who at the time was the news editor of a Weekend World newspaper, was among the scores of journalists, editors and activists rounded up and detained by the apartheid government in a countrywide dragnet. A gentle soul with a passion for jazz, jazz, literature, journalism, and politics. My father, Agri Cluster, contemplated many years later on his detention in his Sowetan column titled On the Line. He stated that, I was among those caught in the countrywide net. Many of us were so incensed to the events preceding the state that detention seemed inevitable, almost an honorable thing to happen to one. His arrest was under Section 10 of the Internal Security Act, a law that was introduced during the Soweto uprising in 1976 to remove political activists from the political arena and to make a provision for the long-term detention of detainees for up to 12 months without trial. Over the past five years, I've spent most of my early mornings pouring through my father's writings, his articles and his columns, searching for him, trying to get a better sense of who he was and the historical events that shaped and molded his thinking. As I read up on him, different dimensions of him are revealed to me. I was introduced to Agri Cluster, the writer, the thinker, editor, and community builder. I was particularly intrigued by his community building initiatives, which sought to rebuild the broken down structures in our communities that had been devastated by apartheid. The more I read, the more I became enthused to follow in his footsteps to continue his nation building legacy. With the help of a handful respected trustees, my family and I have since established the Agri Cluster Trust, AKT in short. AKT is named after my father, Agri Cluster, the famous journalist, editor, and community builder. He's famous for his nation building philosophy, which he launched 33 years ago on October the 22nd, 1988. This was shortly after he became editor of the Sowetan, then the country's leading 
daily newspaper for the black community. He edited the Sowetan from 1988 until 2002. Apart from his superb intellect and captivating writing, Plaster was a visionary who advocated for the rebuilding of community structures that had been shattered by the unspeakable political violence of the mid-1980s. He wanted his community to rekindle the spirit of self-pride and wundu and to get his people psychologically ready for freedom that was clearly on the horizon. Using, his Sowetan, using the Sowetan as a platform to champion his views, he initiated many nation-building projects that sought to bring about the best from members of his community. These included the Early Childhood Development Awards, Young Communicators Awards, Businesswoman of the Year Awards, and my favorite, the Community Builder of the Year Awards. This is a contest that sought to identify and celebrate ordinary South Africans that were implementing extraordinary community-based projects to uplift their communities and empower others. Delivering his speech at the 10th anniversary of the Community Builder of the Year Awards, in, 1980, in 1998, President Nelson Mandela stated that it required profound vision for the Sowetan to conceive his nation building program. The nation building program has done our nation a service. Millions of South Africans watched on national television as the community builders from various communities all across the nation were recognized and awarded prizes at the glitzy gala dinner for their selfless efforts to empower others. Agri Glaster loved his community. He sought solutions for seemingly intractable problems. He wanted to see thriving communities that brimmed with hope for the future. His whole being was shaped by the events in South Africa, and he sought to contribute towards finding unifying measures and solutions through his nation-building philosophy. In 2004, shortly after my father Agri Glaster passed away, former South African president Tabombeki described him in the following manner. Agri Glaster will always be remembered for his contributions to spirited journalism and nation building. His brave stance against the tyranny of apartheid and the days of repression of blacks inspired particularly the youth of South Africa. He represented the established reality of black intellectual achievement many years before the arrival of democracy for which he struggled. That was the kind of man Agri Cluster was. He was a visionary. He was a champion for the less fortunate. He was a wonderful writer. He was a man of the people. He was a compassionate. And when he died in 2004, everyone in the land recognized him for the great man he was. Before he became the Agri Cluster, who was widely admired as a crusading editor and community builder, he was among the many journalists and editors detained by the security police for simply doing their jobs of telling the truth about what was happening in black communities under apartheid. On September the 2nd, 1984, almost a decade after Black Wednesday, Cluster recounts in his Sowetan column those terrifying moments of that cold morning in the backseat of that police car. He writes, we took the road past Pafeni Station to Orlando West, drove towards Laku Rashidi's house, and there I saw the professional detainee go through the motions. He spoke cheerfully with the cops, like old friends, almost backslapping kind of jocular thing going on here. He came out looking fresh and breezy, dressed like he was going mountain climbing, bag and all. I only had the flimsy gear I'd put on that morning in my fright and ignorance but I felt great with Thaku around. I was not alone. He had seen me and if I disappeared or something, there were at least two of us. At the time, Thaku Rashidi was the president of the Black People's Convention, an umbrella organization of the Black Consciousness Movement. Even though Agri Glaster was consoled by Ndadera Rashidi's presence in the back of that police car, he was still very frightened for his life. As a journalist, he knew very well what the security police also known as the mad forces were capable of. He'd covered harrowing stories of people being arrested, tortured, and viciously killed by the police. At that last time, that their Chidi were escorted to the Pratia police station in Soweto, south of Johannesburg, before they were taken to the notorious John Foster Square police station in the Johannesburg city center, which is now called Johannesburg Central Police Station. Back in the 1970s, John Foster Square Police Station was widely feared as the pinnacle torture chambers of the security branch. 
It was the infamous 10th floor of the John Foster Square police station where countless political prisoners were tortured, with some even being thrown out of the windows to plunge to their tragic deaths. Dluster arrived at John Foster Square police station to find that they were not the only ones the police had picked up that morning. They, there were scores of activists and prominent leaders in the black community. The dragnet was as comprehensive as it was brutal. There were leaders such as Dr. Ntato Mutlana, Dr. Leonard Masala, Dr. Douglas Loluane, and many others. Even though this was not Agri Glasser's first stint behind bars, the imposing John Foster Square police station flooded his mind with nightmarish thoughts of police brutality and torture. Many years in his writings, he wrote, many years later, he wrote, John Foster Square, with or without all those familiar faces around, had my mind flitting like a rat. How does it feel like to be, I wanted to ask them, no, I do not wish to know, too ghastly. How does it feel like when they apply, no, you silly fool, relax, relax, that's funny. This is only section 10, not six, you oaf. But how does it really feel like when they, Jesus, police brutality, torture, and murder was a bone-chilling reality for those who stood up to fight against the bar date. A mere month before the security police descended on Agri Glaster's home in Midlands, Bantu Stephen Beagle, the young champion of the Black Consciousness Movement, was callously murdered by the police. Reflecting on that day in his column, Years later, that did last a further wrote, all things considered, those were turbulent days, something similar to what has been happening lately. Among the more searing and heart-rending events was the death of Steve Biko, followed by those chilling words from the then Minister of Justice, Jimmy Kruger. Steve Biko's vicious murder was without a doubt a catalyst for the events that took place on October the 19th, 1977. But let's take a few steps back to set the scene. In the aftermath of the Sharp Vol massacre, which took place on the 21st of March, 1960, the African National Congress, the ANC, and the Pan-Africanist Congress, the PAC, the two leading anti-apartheid political organizations of the time were banned. Black political leaders were either imprisoned, in exile, or killed by the state. This left a gaping void in the black political arena. It seemed as if apartheid had succeeded in breaking the spirit and the back of the resistance in South Africa. Meanwhile, the winds of change were blowing across the African continent. Numerous African states busied themselves with the important business of breaking the chains of colonialism. Back in South Africa, something began to stir in universities all across the nation in the late 1960s. The changes taking place on the continent alongside the civil rights movement in the United States inspired young black South Africans to take a stand against apartheid. University students began cutting their teeth in politics through organizations such as the University Christian Movement, UCM, and the National Union of South African Students, NUSIS. Disillusioned by both organizations with their failure to act against racist policies in the universities, Steve Biko, Bani Pichane, and Mampela Rampela, and others formed the South African Students Association, SASO. The breakaway from NUSAS was partly inspired by the emergence of Black consciousness founded by Ntate Steve Biko. In the early 1970s, SASO was asserting the Black consciousness ideological stance and the independence of black students from white supremacy in universities. By the mid-1970s, the black consciousness movement had spread like a wildfire amongst young black people and began captivating the imagination of adults in the black community with its message. Bigo and his disciples emphasized the importance of black people taking the lead in the struggle against apartheid. Their movement set out to legitimize blackness through affirming a proud and strong black identity against white supremacy. The Black Consciousness Movement further created numerous black community projects aimed at addressing social ills facing black communities. The Black Consciousness, black consciousness Movement took the country by storm 
and left the apartheid authorities feeling anxious because it was becoming clear to them that the black consciousness movement was succeeding in providing an alternative political ideology that opposed apartheid and was filling the void left by the earlier banning of the ANC and PAC. At about the same time, black journalists were also taking a stand, proclaiming that they were black before they were journalists. They formed the Union of Black Journalists, not only to improve their working conditions, but also to push on with their mission to tell the truth, as it were, about the lives of black people under apartheid. For their efforts, the members of the black, the members of the Union of Black Journalists found themselves continuously harassed and detained by the security forces. To shed more light on the situation facing black journalists at the time, former member of the Union of Black Journalists, Mejubi Mayet, in 1997 stated that, I personally was not a political person, but the problem was, if you were black in those days, you were political whether you liked it or not. Now that the, set, now that the scene has been set for you, let us proceed with our story. The apartheid government responded to the black consciousness message by ruthlessly assassinating Steve Biko on the 12th of September, 1977. However, the black consciousness movement did not die as the nationalist government had hoped. On receiving the news of Biko's death, the then Minister of Justice, Jimmy Kruger, famously stated that the murder left him cold. This statement enraged the black oppressed majority and mass protests ensued nationwide. Agri Cluster and his peers at the World and Weekend World took to their pens, wielding them as weapons to launch an assault on the apartheid state. The uprisings of 1976, Steve Biko's death and Black Wednesday were the final push that spurred a global movement against apartheid. From the notorious John Foster Square police station, the impressive catch of journalists, editors and activists was bundled off to Modderby prison near Benoni, east of Johannesburg, back in 1997. Plaster draws a picture of what was happening for us once more. As we drive through one gate after the other, the echo of heavy gates is like the death clap. Dr. Mutlane says rather airily, this is it. We will not be seeing the outside for some time now, chaps. Brace up. It soon became clear to Tluster that he was not only being arrested for his uncompromising writing against the repressive state, but also due to his involvement in the Committee of Ten, an organization that sought to fill the gap in the leadership created, an organization that sought to fill the gap in leadership created in Soweto when the urban Bantu councils were discredited. Nasta began to show signs of his social activism in early 1977 when, together with Percy Koboza, his friend and editor at The World, they spearheaded the initiative to gather respected leaders from Soweto for the Committee of Ten. Fifteen years or so after Black Wednesday, Glaster wrote in his memoir that, we thought we would preempt the government from putting another of their crazy puppet bodies in power. While others were arrested in the early hours of October 19, 19, October 19, 1977, and dragged from their blankets in that countrywide clampdown, Koboza was arrested at work in front of baffled staff members. He was arrested while he was giving an interview on television with a television crew from abroad. In his On the Line Sovetian column, that the cluster once again takes us back to the moment that the Pesu Koboza was arrested. We were detained on that Black Wednesday, 1977. Percy almost stage managed his being picked up. While some of us lesser beings were spirited off rather shamefully in the early hours of the morning from our beds, the police played into Percy's hands by detaining him at his offices and slamming the paper with a ban at about the same time. Other senior journalists of the world newspaper who were behind bars during this time included that the Joel Klaule, that the Tami Mazwai, and that the Willy Bukala. Dr. Mutlana was right. Agri and his fellow detainees would not be seeing the outside for some time. He spent over six months in detention before he was released in 1978. The world then was banned. So when he was released, he reunited with Ndadepesi Koboza at the newly formed 
post-Transvaal newspaper, the predecessor of the Soweto newspaper. Last year, in an interview leading up to the Agri Cluster Annual Colloquium, hosted each year on October the 19th and hosted by the Agri Cluster Trust, Vers University, SANEF, and Sowetan with DM5 Incorporated, Dr. Joe Crawler was asked how many times he had been arrested over his illustrious five decade journalism career for simply doing his job as a journalist in search for the truth. He replied by stating that. It is a very difficult question in the sense that to be, it is a very difficult question in the sense that to the nationalist government, you were a terrorist if you thought differently from the way they were thinking. So you can say that this or that happened to me because I was a journalist. The idea was that my thinking was different from theirs, period. But several days after that interview, I struggled to get my head around the fact that not too long ago, people in my country were detained without trial, tortured, and even killed for their thoughts, their ideas. I vaguely remember my father telling me and my brothers that ideas were very powerful. I could never have imagined that ideas were so powerful, in fact, that people were willing to sacrifice their lives for them. In reading my father's writings and spending time listening to some of his peers, a few of those important ideas jumped at me. The idea that everyone is free to express themselves in a medium of their choice, the idea that everyone is free to determine their own destiny, the idea that everyone deserves to be treated with respect and dignity. I believe that it is important to reflect on what the brave journalists, editors, and activists of 1977 were fighting for to see where we are as a nation. Sadly, it is evident that the struggle is not over. Many families are still going to bed hungry. There are major inequalities in our economy, education, and health systems. The moral fiber of our society is in tatters. The media industry is facing a serious crisis. To make matters worse, our journalists are constantly under attack, creating even more problems for our society. The COVID-19 pandemic has only worsened the problems we already had in our society. It is clear that South Africa is in a grave state of crisis and nation building is needed now more than ever. We must pick up from where the heroes and heroines of October 19, 1977 left off. But where do we start? As part of the inaugural agri Cluster Colloquium in 2020, I had the fortune of listening in on a few interviews where visionaries in the media space shared some of their wisdom on how we can address pressing, fa pressing issues facing the media and our society at large. This is what I have learned. I believe that we can learn a lot from Dr. Joel Trawler's daily exercise of waking up every morning to ask himself what he can do today to make his environment better for himself and those around him. This exercise, I believe, can help each and every one of us to take the responsibility of changing our lives for the better into our own hands. This, I also believe, is the first step of the nation building process. When it comes to the issues of fake news, disinformation, and cyberbullying, Dada Tolue suggested that we start teaching our children a media literacy module from the earliest levels of education. Nowadays, every man, woman, and child has become their own reporter, sub-editor, and distributor. But the problem with this is that the ethical standards that apply to journalists do not apply to ordinary citizens. And that has to change, he added. In line with the nation building ethos, each person must ask themselves if what they're about to post on social media will contribute to us making their environment better for themselves and those around them or not. If not, then why post it? Agri Cluster Trust is already in dialogues with various leading universities in the country to see how we can introduce this media literacy module in all levels of our education system. This initiative is particularly important in an education system that is increasingly becoming more technology-based. Then I got a chance to listen as Obabu Penwell Lamini, the Sowetan journalist, interviewed Dr. Anton Harbour at his home in Johannesburg with the legendary photojournalist Dr. Antonio Mochave. 
When asked about the role of press freedom in strengthening democracy, Ndata Haba stated that a democracy cannot exist without a free, open and critical media. Because the essence of a democracy is that those in power must be accountable to voters. And the media plays a critical role in monitoring that accountability. The media empowers citizens with information about their leaders, their political parties, their policies and debates to make informed decisions when they cast their votes. I was intrigued when I, he added in, his, in the interview that all the other rights, such as the right to housing, health, education and employment are protected also by the media by giving people information around these matters. Two days later, I arrived at Babu Tami Mazwai's home for our next interview. Babu Mazwai spoke about the importance of the media making sure that the people on the ground were heard. He added that there must be a change in the mindset of the media to initiate a campaign aimed at reminding the nation about matters affecting social cohesion on a constant basis. He added, the people will not suffer forever. At some point, they will say enough is enough, and inevitably, there will be an explosion. Echoes of my father's call for the people to start rebuilding the nation immediately before liberation rang in my ears. There was a sense of urgency in Babu Mazwai's words. Unfortunately, he was correct, because nine months later in July this year, we all witnessed the wild, violent protests that shook our entire country to its core. Listening to Babu Subusi Songal, or the Newsroom Africa political editor and SANEF chairman speak about the plight of journalists due to the COVID-19 pandemic was truly moving. It reminded us that the carnage inflicted by the pandemic on the economy translated to empty pockets, families going hungry, and many journalists losing their jobs with over 80 community newspapers closing. Babungwala said that this also meant that the industry was shrinking. And this also meant that there's a reduction in the number of diverse voices that speak for our society. Amidst all the gloom, he added, there were some green shoots. He mentioned two of his former colleagues who had recently created digital media platforms. This indeed was inspiring. And a few days later, it was Ndata Staili Karambaulis, the Daily Maverick publisher and CEO, who offered his pearls of wisdom. He stated that all industries are becoming digital and the media must follow suit and explore different ways of generating revenue in the digital space and other sectors going forward. These ideas, alongside our nation building manifesto, have played an important role in informing us at the AgriCluster Trust on how we can structure our programs to help tackle the pressing issues currently facing our media and society at large. Our manifesto reads as follows. Nation building means picking up the pieces and rebuilding all structures that have collapsed in our communities. It means striving for the best in all that we do for ourselves and our people. It is the search for the acquisition and control of structures of power required for the survival of a nation. It is creating an efficient leadership and increasing the value and quality of life among all inhabitants of our country. We have a vision of a future society we want to create for ourselves and our children. Nation building is our hope for the future. In closing, I'd like to ask you to please continue to follow our nation building conversations with each other series of Black Wednesday commemorative events. Tomorrow, the 20th of October, 2021, we have two more events. A workshop by the Institute for the Advancement of Journalism in partnership with VITS and the AgriCluster Trust titled The Need for Responsible Journalism in Nation Building. Tomorrow, we also have an inspiring dialogue on women in media, also hosted by the VITS University and the AgriCluster Trust on Newsroom Africa, and the discussion will be with Mekheri Mothathad. On the 30th of October, we also have the political revival discussion at the Forge focusing on Black consciousness message in contemporary South Africa. 
We also have on the 30th of October, Dr. Musub Musubudi Mangana's book launch hosted by the Steve Biko Foundation. We at the Agri Cluster Trust and our partners are inspired by the heroes and heroines of Black Wednesday, those who dared to take a stand to rebuild our nation. I thank you very much for your time. Good. Thank you for that address and, and also moving and personal touch and testament. Um, I just uh, want to pick up on a, on, on a couple of things there. Um, I, I certainly agree with you about the media literacy. It's something which I've proposed before as well and to equip people with the world today and one might add uh, logical thinking. Um, th there were a lot of newspapers that were critical um, at the time. I mean, not a lot of newspapers. There were some criticism and there were some that were, that were opposed philosophically to the apartheid regime. Uh, but they didn't find themselves, uh, they found themselves censored, self-censored a lot. Uh, but not actually closed down or their editors uh, uh, arrested. I mean, because quite a few journalists were expelled as well. Uh, you alluded to that there was black consciousness that was the, the key element there. And I'm wondering if you don't think that the media freedom narrative has come to dominate this day of Black Wednesday, um, whereas black consciousness was really the, was an underlying issue. Um, and how do we address that? Mm -hmm. Uh, th thank you for your question, and Dr. Meersman. Um, you know, this is a discussion that we've had with Dr. Uh, Tholu, of course, who was amongst those who were uh, 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 detained uh, and tortured during that time uh, for simply doing his job as a journalist. But as you heard me say as well, um, uh, the, the way that he described it is that um, the day cannot be seen as a day um, for black consciousness because it wasn't only the black consciousness movement that was uh, 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 clamped down on. I mean, there were priests that were uh, arrested in their day. Um, and I mean, the Pro Veritate was, a, was, a, was not a publication that was aligned to the black consciousness philosophy. Uh, it was a, a religious uh, publication. And uh, it was a dark day for the media as well, newspapers being uh, uh, banned. and. In that sense, it was a dark day for South Africa as a whole and not a dark day for black consciousness. And I like his emphasis on the fact that uh, the apartheid government sought to, 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 to break down anybody that thought differently. So, I mean, that, that, that could have been anybody who was thinking differently. But that also does not take away the important role of black consciousness. Because, as you know, my father's nation building initiative was also deeply inspired by black consciousness. And it was that black consciousness spirit that was able to push a lot of our people to take a stand and to also start thinking about their own identity and to start uh, asking critical questions about what the apartheid government was, was doing to our people, what it was even saying uh, about people and black lives. Thank you. Um, I was wondering, um, what is the message? Uh, we've, we've got quite a, a good situation in many ways uh, in terms of media freedom in South Africa, um, but beyond our borders um, on the continent, uh, the situation is very, very different in, in many of the countries. Um, what, what is the message that we have um, from South Africa, or also even from a from a black consciousness perspective, how does that speak uh, to medium freedom mm. elsewhere uh, on the continent? Well, I mean, again, if you look at the nation building philosophy, um, you will see that it was also influenced by Pan Africanism, and uh, the message you know that Pan African as Pan Africanism uh, uh, pushes is that. Uh, Africans, wherever they are, don't only share history, but they share destiny, a common destiny. So we are linked to Africans in the continent, to Africans in the diaspora as well. So when we succeed, they succeed as well. And it's important to understand that oneness, which also speaks to that ethic of Ubuntu, which is innate in all of us. And I think, again, when you look at uh, uh, the nation building conversations with each other, which we've initiated, nation building can happen 
anywhere in the world. It is not a concept that is only limited to South Africa. So in, in, in the coming years, we look forward to having discussions that go across our, our, our borders and making sure that we can have an exchange of ideas uh, in order to, 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 to tackle these critical issues facing our, our continent and, and the world. Thank you. Um, I think that um, we are going to, I think that's our closing comment, actually, and, I, and it's a good one um, for reaching out onto, onto the continent. Um, we'll make this uh, recording available, um, a lecture on, on YouTube and on Facebook for everyone. Um, and uh, I think that concludes it for today. Thank you very much for, uh, for that address. And we wish you all the best of luck with the project and we'll continue to support you. It was an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much, and that Miesman and your wonderful team. We really, really appreciate it. Mimagrit, thank you so much.